So our first speaker today is Billy Kessler from NOAA PMEL. He will discuss the findings from the TPOS 2018 and the Air Sea Interaction Workshops, in addition to process study opportunities of the future. So thank you so much for starting us off, Billy, and we'll turn it over to you. So um, thanks to the uh, organizers for uh, inviting me here. I'm really excited and I have, you'll see at the end, the list of questions. And so I'm going to talk about the background of this workshop and uh, part of that, or a big part of that is about the evolution of the TPOS 2020 project. So that's the tropical Pacific observing system, which was originally driven by ENSO and specifically by the El Nino of 1982-83, which um, some of you who are uh, older will remember that we only knew from scattered merchant ship observations. So the uh, the global ramifications of that uh, El Nino, uh, it made it clear that we needed an observing system. And it also seemed like uh, ideas were coming out that was going to give us predictability. So that is still, uh, and so it's still a major motivation. Now, the project itself was born from the Tau crisis of 2012, 2014. Many of you probably know that the Tau moored array uh, collapsed during that time. And um, well, it's a long story. And unfortunately, we're not going to have a chance to have a beer together. So uh, the short answer is that uh, my organization, NOAA, which does many wonderful things, uh, didn't appreciate the multiple uh, functions of an observing system and made some bad decisions, and we're still dealing with the consequences of that. So uh, we are trying to seize an opportunity from the crisis, and that is by rethinking the design of the arrays in light of new science needs and new technology. And you can think of uh, at the time the tower array was designed, there were no routine satellite observations except SST, and there was no Argo. So there's clearly uh, opportunity there. Um, and we're now trying to take advantage both of the uh, technological possibilities and of the much more sophisticated science questions that we have now to design a, a backbone, a, a sustained observing system that meets our new science needs. And uh, there's a lot of things in here. We wrote many reports, but uh, one of the important things is to refocus the moored array where its unique strengths are needed. So those are particularly the ability to sample fast, so 10 or 20 minute data, to do it consistently, to make co-located ocean and met OBS, and to measure direct velocity. So that points the moored array at the mixed layer and the surface fluxes and also the equator where those strengths are needed. And uh, down on the lower left, I have a map of the reconfiguration, but in my mind, the most important thing we're doing is shown on the right, which is to increase the density of uh, sampling in the ocean mixed layer. So you can see it goes from very sparse on the left to every five meters at least on the right to add a current meter near the surface and to greatly beef up the MET sampling so that we'll be able to make routine uh, uh, bulk flux measurements uh, from the sustained array much more broadly than has been possible. And how does it go to the next one? There we go. So the um, TPOS plan is built on what we call the backbone that is mostly Argo moorings and satellites. Uh, we call it a backbone because it's the skeleton that supports other work, which is what most of us do, research, pilot studies, process studies, model development. And you can think of it like the material and the in intellectual infrastructure that underpins everything else. So it's material because you can make observations from the ships that service these arrays. You can hang things on buoys. It's intellectual because it provides background climatology and uh, temporal and spatial context to any other work you would do. The backbone is also the climate record, so that's a precious piece. Uh, the backbone lets you do CalVal and interpretation of satellite sampling. And I'm thinking now uh, of the future of radar surface velocity measurements from satellites, and that is going to require substantial insight to uh, observation so we understand uh, what, it, what that means. And finally, we have a very important stakeholder, which is operational forecasting. That pays most of the bills of this observing system and uh, cannot be ignored. 
So we think of the uh, backbone as evolving slowly uh, and the process studies are integral to that evolution. And looking at that, what the vision is, and I'm not going to go through all this slide, but over here on the left, you see what's the, the, the guts of the sustained observing system, and down on the lower right, a few possibilities for the future. But I really want to point you to the orange text with that orange arrow pointing at it, which brings out the importance of modeling. So there are two points. The first is that um, these very diverse sampling technologies produce, uh, have sampling characteristics that are very hard to put together. And so individual scientists, most of us here probably use uh, their particular instrument. But in fact, if you want to put this together, you need a, a credible model and a credible assimilation system to integrate those into uh, something like what we have in the atmosphere. And the second is, that although we might use our individual instruments, in fact, T-Post data reaches our stakeholders primarily as the output of an assimilation. So for both of those reasons, the models are really crucial. They add a tremendous amount of value uh, that the observations are more than the sum of their parts. So we had two uh, previous workshops, the first in 2018. I'll talk about that on the next slide. Uh, in May of 2019, we had a workshop, Atmospheric Convection and Air-Sea Interaction, that focused on precipitation controls over the warm pool. And so this is the whole slew of processes by which organized convection in the atmosphere affects the ocean, which then affects the uh, atmosphere again, and the, that whole zoo of processes. That workshop was um, highly motivated to look at the MJO and to understand the MJO, and that remains a very important uh, piece of what we're doing. Uh, it talked about boundary layer interactions and their effects on the large scale, and this is stuff that you're going to hear about a lot um, during this week. And it concluded recommending a supersite mooring that would anchor process studies. Now, the bridging workshop uh, was really uh, focused by two process studies that had bubbled up over the preceding few years uh, from the uh, community itself. And those were the uh, pump, which is Pacific upwelling and mixing physics that pinpoints the cold tongue and the upwelling and mixing above the equatorial undercurrent. So these are things that are uh, uh, are the communication between the surface and the fluxes and the thermocline that contains uh, the ocean memory. It's modulated on diurnal time scales, tropical instability waves, the annual cycle, interannual, and probably longer than that, and uh, is trying to be realistic about how that communication occurs, how the ocean memory is felt by the atmosphere and vice versa. The other uh, process study is called the Eastern Edge of the Warm Pool, and that's looking at how the, as the warm pool moves east and west, uh, how that tremendous heat source in the atmosphere then modulates or uh, modifies the winds above it, which then contribute to uh, further uh, motion of the warm pool. Uh, again, it focuses on the MJO and the many processes, and they're illustrated down here on the lower right, uh, of the short vertical scales in the warm pool. So these are the uh, you have fresh puddles, you have uh, hot spots, and you have uh, uh, short uh, uh, zonal jets at the surface. You have interleaving. There's a whole variety of processes that are uh, have short vertical scales, but rectify into the SST. And if you were to have about 90 seconds for your talk, oh, okay. just to let you know. Very good, I'm close to it. Okay, so the shorter version of these two studies is let's get serious. Our models are ready to take observational guidance and be more realistic. And I'll give one example from Pump that we have a simple idea of shallow thermocline equals cool SST, and that enabled building the delayed oscillator and really an understanding of how ENSO works. But it's arm wavy as hell, and we think we are ready to be serious and we have the models to do it. So, final slide. 
uh, what I hope for from this workshop or from the TPOS 2020 point of view is two things. One is to uh, get closer to defining the process work that will guide the future evolution of the backbone. And especially that's true because of how much we depend on advancing our models. And finally, and I'm not going to read this list to you, uh, we have some uh, important issues that remain fuzzy. And uh, what I'll be listening for in the next uh, few days is uh, these kind of questions. And I hope now I can leave them up here and maybe people will help me discuss them. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Billy. So while we're waiting, um, Billy, I'm going to, to just ask you a general question as to um, what types of process studies do you feel um, would be appropriate for either one of the follow on studies that have been going on for the last couple of years, uh, pump or uh, the warm pool extension. Well, uh, to me, the really big issue is the, the mixing, the vertical mixing. And I think of the equatorial undercurrent and the shear between the undercurrent and the south equatorial current that flows westward above it, that mean background shear and the marginal instability state is conducive. It, it's a low Richardson number and it makes that mixing possible. And somehow we know that that uh, is a key piece of the communication. It's kind of illustrated in this picture from Jim Moom on the left. And uh, to me, that's the thing that, first of all, we don't know very well. And second of all, that we're in a position to implement those in models. So that's one thing I would suggest. Okay, thank you. And then, um... Nadia Schiffer has a question. Uh, they're coming fast and furious. Uh, what are the targeted operational requirements or uh, the near for near real time data assimilation? Well, okay, I'm I'm the wrong person to answer that question. Uh, we we may have if, if you'd like to pass, we may have someone who who would take that on in a later. Uh, uh, yeah, how, how about Magdalena? <laughs> yeah, well, maybe we'll throw it to her. So, um, Mike Patterson asked, what is the time frame for implementing the new backbone that process studies can leverage? The, uh, let's say three years. Um, I'm, I'm an optimist, but I'm hoping that we will have implemented the uh, changes in, in three years. And maybe it's important to say that NOAA is planning to maintain the present tower array while also implementing these enhancements for a three year period. And we hope to have the Argo doubled during that time and several of the uh, operational prediction centers around the world, not just NOAA, are looking at that as an opportunity to do a real uh, comparison to run their simulation systems in parallel. Here's our old system. And here's our new system and to be able to see, okay, how much do these sustained observations actually matter? So I'm, I'm optimistic that that will happen in three years and what that means and then be maintained for three years. And so that to me is the window where the process studies would have uh, be able to have a large effect. All right, and so just to follow on uh, to that, perhaps Anish has asked um, what what level of international coordination will continue past the TPOS 2020 uh, report phase and ongoing future missions? And this will be the last question, then we'll proceed to our next speaker. I'm so glad you asked that because TPOS 2020 um, is over, or it's finishing, we're writing our final report, um, and we're uh, we've proposed an ongoing structure, which is simpler, but it requires uh, two important elements. One is a uh, scientific advisory panel because uh, lots of things are ideas are coming up and uh, the uh, agencies that will do the implementation need that kind of advice. And second, a coordination group so that the different agencies and nations can uh, make their stuff fit together. So uh, we're looking for people who would like to be uh, either on a scientific advisory panel or as part of a coordination group, because there are multiple contributors to this and it's a non-trivial problem. And yes, we're, uh, thank you for asking that. 